Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the final session of the day. As we all know, disability is a subject of cultural politics. And it is also a subject of cultural diplomacy, which can be approached from a variety of perspectives. In today's lecture, we are going to take a look at disability and cultural diplomacy from the perspective of the grassroots. And we are extremely fortunate to have with us Professor Stephen Cuchesto. Welcome, Professor. But, Thank I, before, you. but before I hand over the right to you, it's my great pleasure to welcome back Professor GJV Prashad, who has already been with us, and I guess everybody is familiar with. But just to repeat, Professor Prasad has been my teacher, and he is still my teacher, <laughs> and more than a teacher, he's a philosopher and a guy. So welcome, sir. Thank you, Somish. And I see that you missed out friend. You just said philosopher and guy, and did not add friend, and I'm quite upset about it. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to chair this session, especially because uh, Stephen Guchisto, who's just told me how to pronounce his name, and I hope I'm getting it right, is <laughs> a professor at Syracuse. He's a director of the interdisciplinary programs and outreach at the Burton Blatt Institute. He's a writer, and, a, and by that I mean someone who's written memoirs, someone who writes essays, but and I'm making here because a poet is a writer too, but I'd like to say he's a writer and a poet uh, because I see poetry as calling for something else altogether from writing uh, memoirs and writing uh, essays. Uh, it, it's a different sensibility, I, I, I tend to think, uh, as somebody who writes poetry myself. So it's a one, you know, it's great to be chairing this session. As I was saying, he's written the memoirs Planet of the Blind, which is a notable book of the year at New York Times. And eavesdropping, a memoir of blindness and listening. And his poetry collections are only bread, only light, and letters to Borges. His newest memoir, which I should also have mentioned, is Have Dog Will Travel, A Poet's Journey, published by Simon & Schuster. Uh, among other things, he's also been an advisor to the Metropolitan M Museum and the Museum of Modern Art in New York and the National Endowment for the Arts in Washington. His essays, and I told you he's an essayist as well, have been published everywhere. The New York Times, the Washington Post, Harper's, the Reader's Digest. And I'm, something I've not done, and I must follow up now on, is his blog, daily blog, called The Planet of Blind, which I believe is quite well known. I asked someone and they said, oh, that's, he's going to be speaking. And I said, yes. And you know, they asked me whether I follow the blog and I checked online and sure enough, uh, he has a lovely blog going there. His, I believe, uh, he sees himself, he now thinks of himself as writing political poetry. Uh, and I always thought that how else, what else can one write except political poetry anyway now? <laughs> so, that's right. That's right. So that's I'm, exactly right. <laughs> I'm keen to listen to him, so I shall not stand the way between you and, and the audience and the, the listeners and our speaker. So it's all yours, sir, now. Stephen, well, please. thank you. Thank you very much. I'm privileged to be here. Uh, I'm thankful to be joining with you to discuss disability really as a way of knowing. Disability is a form of, of creative intelligence. I think when we talk about cultural diplomacy, we're really talking about people to people. We're talking about grassroots, uh, the engagement of awakened minds across borders, people aiming for a better world. We're now living in a time when the disabled are increasingly able to travel. 
uh, and when it's possible for cultural engagements to happen uh, that involve disabled people. And uh, that's an exciting new era in, uh, I think, our collective history. Um, I call this talk Cultural Diplomacy and the Art of Getting Lost. Uh, one of the fun things about traveling, as I do uh, as a person who is uh, blind, is that I often find myself getting lost uh, in strange places. And remarkably, that's an interesting thing. Uh, I meet new people. Uh, I discover things I hadn't imagined. Uh, and uh, it's, a kind of, it's a kind of wonderful uh, surprise that happens uh, when you travel, especially outside of uh, your comfort zone. So uh, let me begin. In, in his excellent biography of James Holman called A Sense of the World, how a blind man became history's greatest traveler. Jason Roberts writes, until the invention of the internal combustion engine, the most prolific traveler in history was also the most unlikely. Born in 1786, James Holman was in many ways the quintessential world explorer, a dashing mix of discipline, recklessness and accomplishment, a knight of Windsor, fellow of the Royal Society and best-selling author. It was easy to forget that he was intermittently crippled and permanently blind. Let me just pause there and say, what a great description of discipline. I mean, of disability itself uh, as a lived experience he was a dashing mix of discipline, recklessness, and accomplishment. That's a great description of uh, disabled life. Anyway, I write, uh, I'm not sure about the forgetting, right? It says that he was forgotten. I'm not sure about the forgetting. Though Holman's celebrity dimmed over time, his blindness was always the point, and in this and this in part is why we remember him now. I'll venture to say he was the first disabled cultural diplomat, someone who implicitly recognized disability as a way of knowing, disability as epistemology. As a legally blind poet, I believe getting lost is an art form. Holman is my great foundational ancestor. Let's put him uh, on the blind Mount Rushmore with Homer, Milton, Annie Sullivan, Helen Keller, and Ray Charles. By the way, I think Homer was several people, all of them women. <laughs> all disabled life is performance. When a person is consigned to stasis through warehousing, lack of accommodations, insufficient health care, lack of education, steepened cultural dynamics, a disabled child is hidden so as not to affect the prospects of a sibling's arranged marriage. The disabled performance signifies uselessness. As the American novelist William Gass once wrote, culture has completed its work when everything is a sign. I imagine gas was being ironic since culture is a river, Heraclitus tells us. We enter it, but never at the same point. Even Keats, whose name is written on water, can't signify the entire river. The point, of course, is to enter it. There's no reason why the experience of travelers with disabilities should differ markedly from those without. The imaginative and or experiential discoveries of the disabled are lyric ones, unforeseeable and unique. Holman observed, most sighted travelers didn't see much. <laughs> Think about that, a blind world traveler observed, most sighted travelers didn't see much. 
attention isn't the sole province of the sighted. This is obvious to those who teach disability studies, performance studies, or any form of cultural studies. The individual, whoever she is, brings it to the analysis, surprise, wonder, sorrow, and a myriad of archetypes to every encounter. And so it must be also with those of us who are cripples. Disability scholar and performance artist Petra Cuppers, referring to disability dance workshops, puts it this way, quote, subjective bodily engagement is tacit in the process of trying to make sense of another's somatic knowledge. There is no other way to approach the felt dimensions of movement experience than through the researcher's own body. Disability is somatic not, and disability travel is always a cultural enterprise, not as William Gass would have it, a matter of static signs Disabled movers are the purveyors of somatic knowing, which is in turn the moving imagination. Disability as cultural diplomacy is a grassroots enterprise. Now, I don't know if in India you remember Van Cliburn. He was a classical pianist who at the height of the Cold War uh, became famous uh, momentarily because he won a big piano prize in Moscow. So anyway, I say here, disability is cultural diplomacy is a grassroots enterprise. One shouldn't confuse it with say, Van Cliburn. Remember, he was a gangly 23 year old music project prodigy from Texas, who in 1958 improbably won the first international Tchaikovsky piano competition in Moscow. Because the Cold War was in full swing, Van Cliburn became a global celebrity. And to this day, he's the only classical musician in American history to receive a ticker tape parade in New York. <laughs> Cultural diplomacy is many things, of course. It's been a determined product of states or state influence throughout history. Artists and intellectuals, inventors, have traveled at the behest of governments as de facto advertisements for the advantages of French language, abstract expressionism, jazz, Italian opera, Malaysian ballet, Russian poetry, you name it. One may say that all of Pablo Neruda's career was a matter of cultural diplomacy. Refugees are also cultural diplomats. What is the disability dynamic of cultural diplomacy? This is a long quote from a book called The Diplomacy of Culture by Irina Kozmika, who writes, since the end of the Cold War, culture and identity rather than ideology have been increasingly recognized as key forces in shaping global order, culture and identity. The rise of identity politics and religious revivalism have been feeding debates on the clash of civilizations and Islam's challenges to the West. In parallel, debates have been focusing on globalization, broadly defined as an empirical process of increasing worldwide economic, political, technological, and cultural interconnectedness. Globalization's impact on culture has been viewed as both a blessing and a curse. On the one hand, offering unprecedented opportunities for interactive and enriching cultural exchanges, and therefore increasing cultural diversity and on the other, leading to uniformity or tensions between cultures. In many parts of the world, globalization is perceived as a threat to national cultures 
and traditional forms of identity. As a result, and contrary to earlier predictions of the end of history, the forces of globalization appear to be more nurturing than destructive of the reaffirmation of sovereignties and in reaction of the demands for recognition of regional and local differences. In these conditions, managing cultural diversity is increasingly becoming one of the major issues and concerns of the day, intrinsically linked with international security, social cohesion, and development. Indeed, cultural diversity at the international level overlaps with the now extensive debates on multiculturalism within states. Nation states are increasingly focused on historically marginalized people. And though this isn't universal, as state oppression proves, disability is increasingly viewed as an important factor in interconnectedness. Milton C. Cummings describes cultural diplomacy as the exchange of ideas, information, values, systems, traditions, beliefs, and other aspects of culture with the intention of fostering mutual understanding. Quoting the philosopher Jean-Luc Nancy, Petra Kuppers writes, community is what takes place always through others and for others. It is not the space for the egos, subjects and substances that are at the bottom immortal, but of the eyes who are always others or else are nothing. A crip community, a disabled community, therefore is not the autonomous push and pull of national relations, but a field, much as poetry is a field. One is reminded of the American poet Robert Duncan's poem, often, I am permitted to return to a meadow. Duncan writes, Often I am permitted to return to a meadow as if it were a scene made up by the mind that is not mine, but is a made place that is mine. It is so near to the heart, an eternal pasture folded in all thought so that there is a hall therein that is a made place created by light where from the shadows that are forms fall, where from fall all architectures. I am, I say, our likenesses of the first beloved, whose flowers are the flames lit to the lady. She it is, queen under the hill, whose hosts are a disturbance of words within words that is a field folded. It is only a dream of the grass blowing east against the source of the sun. In an hour before the sun's going down, whose secret we see in a children's game of ring around a roses told. Often I am permitted to return to a meadow as if it were a given property of the mind that certain bounds hold against chaos that is a place of first permission, everlasting omen of what is. Disability is itself a disturbance of words within words. It's filled with evanescence, indeterminacies, longings, strange permissions, properties of the mind that are both chaos and bounds against it. When I wrote my collection of poems, Letters to Borges, I was conscious of this cripple's principle, an ars poetica, that getting lost is a strange permission. And for me as a man who has struggled to become an independent traveler, Getting lost is an everlasting delight. I knew that Borges, the great Argentine poet, right, who was blind, never learned to travel by himself. 
and I wished to convey to his spirit something of the intellectual joy of wandering blind. Here's a little poem called Letter to Borges from Estonia. So here I am getting lost in Estonia. Where I go is of considerable doubt. Winter, Tallinn, I climb aboard the wrong trolley. Always a singular beam of light leads me astray. After thousands of cities, I am safe when I say, it is always the wrong trolley. Didn't I love you with my whole heart, Athens, Dublin? So low gravitational effects, my body is light as it beside the botanical garden's iron fence. But turning a corner, one feels very old in the shadow of the mariner's church. I ask strangers to tell me where I am. Their voices are lovely, young and old. Yes, I loved you with my whole heart. I never had a map. Coordinated platonic movement in deep snow, crooked doors and radios in the bread shops. Back to Jean-Luc Nancy, community is what takes place always through others and for others. It is not the space for the egos, subjects and substances that are at the bottom immortal, but of the eyes who are always others or else are nothing. When I ask strangers where I am, I'm engaged in discovery, not need, beauty, not loss. This is the James Holman effect. One mode of somatic or bodily knowledge is thriving in the unknown. My wanderings unsign the signs, the antithesis of William Gass. Cultural diplomacy is many things, but let's suppose for the sake of argument <laughs> that the US State Department has it right. In a 2005 white paper, they wrote, cultural diplomacy is a two-way street. For every foreign artist inspired by an American work of art, there is an American waiting to be touched by the creative wonders of other traditions. Culture spreads from individual to individual, often by subterranean means, in exchange programs like Fulbright, Humphrey and Muskie, in person to person contacts made possible by international visitor and student exchange programs, ideas that we hold dear of family, education and faith, cross borders, creating new ways of thinking. As a blind writer who's written about traveling the world by ear, I'm attracted also to this from the State Department. To practice effective cultural diplomacy, we must first listen to our counterparts in other lands, seeking common ground with curators and writers, filmmakers and theater directors, choreographers and educators, that is with those who are engaged in exploring the universal values of truth and freedom. The quest for meaning is shared by everyone and every culture has its own way of seeking to understand our walk in the sun. We must not imagine 
that our attempts to describe reality hold for everyone. Indeed, the history of art and literature is an essay in cross-fertilization. And American culture gains from its dialogue with the artistic and intellectual riches of other cultures. American artists who travel abroad in official and unofficial capacities are cultural diplomats who make incalculable contributions to the body politic. As Joan Chanek notes, artists engage in cross-cultural exchange not to proselytize about their own values, but rather to understand different cultural traditions, to find new sources of imaginative inspiration, to discover new methods and ways of working and to exchange ideas with people whose worldviews differ from their own. From a disability perspective, one finds through travel that poverty, lack of educational opportunities, inaccessible architectures and social policies are obstacles to inclusion across the globe. One also finds that disability art, when taught from a place that taught for and with disabled students, creates crypt space, a language, a field of somatic knowing. Not long ago, I spoke with blind children in Nur Sultan. Now, in America, we have a term, inspiration pornography. I don't know if you know this term in India. Uh, it's gained a lot of attention. Uh, it's a push by disabled people to say, we're not inspirational. We're not here to make the non-disabled feel good. We're not here to give you a cheap sense of value, right? So the disabled have come to call this inspiration pornography. Um, not long ago, I spoke with blind children in Nur Sultan. Will I be called an inspiration pornographer when I say they were beautiful? A small girl in a white dress with angel wings sang a song. An equally tiny boy who was dressed like latter-day Elvis Presley also sang his heart out. Teachers brought forward a blind autistic boy who spontaneously added large sums. None of them had much in the way of orientation and mobility skills. They were talented and were led about. I was a foreign blind poet who felt himself shivering apart, like a ship coming apart. I was aground on a reef of hardship. Parents wanted to know how I made it as a blind student. And I had to tell them the way is hard. Had to say the blind must work steadfastly and without pause. That in many instances, we must work harder than sighted people. Even then we need luck and love in Kazakhstan, disabled children are largely segregated. And though the Kazakhs have signed the UN Charter on Disability Rights, in effect committing their nation to disability justice, the way forward for the disabled is still steep. And this is true in my own country, God knows. One thinks of all the universities in the United States that still adopt inaccessible software and course materials, colleges that imagine the disabled are structurally apart from student life. Isn't there a special office for them? One shouldn't imagine that with our mighty ADA and the UN Charter on Disability Rights, we're now living in a shining city on a hill. But I heard small children singing and I thought of the poet Emily Dickinson's remark about the writing of poetry, that the imagination is like whistling as we walk past a graveyard. It's best to sing. 
the imagination does not transcend disablement or color or ethnicity or gender. But as the American poet W.S. Merwin once pointed out, it, imagination, lives up here and a little to the left. Poetry is clear like the clouds in a Tintoretto painting, and each of us has access to this. When we come down from this space, we're refreshed. Intellectual refreshment is a human right. The disabled imagination is a human right. In Almaty, Kazakhstan, student poets, dancers, and musicians come together and perform their work as part of the disability and cultural diplomacy workshop my friends and I have been teaching. As a teaching poet, I'm after art, not the reductiveness of identity. Our students both have and do not have disabilities and to the best of my knowledge have had no inclusive engagement. So we started out by dancing in a large public space, circling, bending, reaching, dipping, swaying, going low, wide, small, very large. As the poet Elizabeth Bishop knew, the imagination has cardinal points, but far more than the average map indicates, we're making new maps for our insides. We talked about how art lets us imagine places that can't be seen or drawn with a pencil. We talked about inner freedom. During a trip, trip to China, I find myself talking about poetry and dragons with blind teenagers. Suddenly everyone is flying across the sky and sewing poems in the clouds. This is cultural diplomacy and disability consciousness. I tell them as a blind poet, I spend my time putting words in clouds. They get it. It isn't easy because normalizing practices in speech tend toward the elimination of complexity. And what is disability after all? The complexity. Disability is the ear inside the ear, folded and curly, perceptive and inapparent on the common street. This is how it is. That deaf woman, that wheelchair man, the blind walker, all are more imaginative than we may know or better than normality will admit. Those of us in the disability studies arena talk about disabilities as ways of knowing precisely because as the writer Jay Dolmage notes, we understand imperfect, extraordinary, non-normative bodies as the origin and epistemological homes of all meaning making. Imperfect and extraordinary are not, are not of or pertaining to custom in Western thought, though as Dolmage demonstrates in his wonderful book, Disability Rhetoric, one may peel back the layers of storytelling and find examples of disability as a wide principle. Precisely because it isn't easy, disability is contentious to the normal body politic, which always hopes to ignore disability perspectives in favor of delimiting narratives, limiting stories, right? Whether we're talking about a bad novel with a forlorn disabled character or an educational plan for a disabled student, making disability easy is to not admit it into either a complex theoretical imaginative or practical arena. Who among us disabled hasn't been pressured in many circumstances to say disability is easy? Oh, it's nothing we say because the literal daily experience of disability both inconveniences normal thinking and because we 
feel always the implicit demand to project overcoming, which in terms of storytelling is always easy. You kiss the prince, pull the brass ring, and you go home cured or lucky. There's a term in rhetoric called proleptic. It means uh, the anticipation of possible obstacles or objections in order to answer them in advance. <clears throat> Traveling blind is a performance both within uh, normative uh, stories and outside cultural depictions of helplessness. Blind travel taken as performance is proleptic. That is, I'm anticipating possible objections in order to answer them in advance, okay? So uh, in the restaurant that doesn't want me, I'm an inscription. It says on the storyboard, I doubled my misfortune by moving. Motion is script. Moreover, it's lyric writing. By writing, we discover our subject. Lyric discovery means disability was never what was thought, was never static, was always moving, both physically and in the mind. Let's be clear, lyric imagination, and by lyric, I mean you're making up the poem or the story as you go. Lyric imagination is never helpless. It's incapable of dishonesty. It's every discovery is just that, a pure finding. In the city of Almaty in Kazakhstan, I watch as my friend and colleague Damani Phillips, who's a great jazz saxophone player, leads an inclusive workshop on jazz. Every student plays his or her favorite instrument. There's an electric piano, a bass guitar, a violin. But what's best is that everyone sings. They sing a song that just hours before did not exist. So that's my prepared talk, uh, which I read rather fast, I'm afraid. Uh, for me, as a, as a person who loves to get to know others, I think it's exciting to have the opportunity to talk. Uh, so I'm hoping that there will be room here for, you know, questions and observations and reactions. And uh, please don't be shy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It was a wonderfully layered talk. Uh, mm. there are many, you know, it's... it's, it's It'll take a little unpacking, but it's really beautiful talk. And I'm sure there are people who want to take this things up with you, have their opinions and questions as well. Uh, so it's open to the audience. I shall not stand in the way again. And please, since I'm, for the first time, I'm doing a Zoom call on a phone. I don't even know oh, how, how, to interesting. Work, how to work this through because my desktop collapsed. So oh, no. If, if anyone wants to speak, just speak. Uh, okay, I see one raised hand. I, I don't know who it is. Will you just from speak, please? Professor Prasad? Yes. This is Sandeep. Uh, I could Hi, wait Sandeep. for the hand raise and I could come after. No, no, if, please if, come. Please be first on the line. Please. Thank you, Professor Prasad. And uh, Professor Kosisto, it was just, it was just mind-blowing. I mean, I was feeling I'm sitting in a meditative talk of a kind that took me traveling from places to places. Thank you very much for that. I think uh, as much as one enjoys reading your book, also for the first time I had, a, I had the fortune of listening to you live. So I'm, I'm super excited and I'm also a person with blindness. So for me... You are, yeah. Yes, 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 I am. And it is just fascinating to listen to your, all of what your, uh, you know, experiences have been and I've read your book, eavesdropping, and trust me, a lot of times I felt, oh, oh my God, this has happened to me. This has happened to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the uh -huh. detailing yes. with which, the detail 
detailing with which you talk about your long walk and you and your dog falling and then you know you 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 figuring it out how he may or may not have got hurt and he's fine from there to go on to everything that that one reads uh i just wanted to ask you if you ever been to india while you've traveled so many places well now that's really interesting that you ask me that because i have to say as a poet i view india as one of the greatest uh poetry cultures and yeah. you know i i read indian poetry in and and tamil poetry and you know in translation and i'm wow. always just my mind is blown uh by the power and beauty and depth uh and wisdom wow uh, in- Professor Prasad will be very happy to know because he's he belongs to he's a, he's a Tamilian himself. Yay! Yeah. Right. Well, you know, <laughs> yay! Uh, uh, so I have always wanted to come to India, and so I have to figure out a way to do that. Uh, yeah, we we fact- invite you. We invite you with you know absolute uh, 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 happiness that if you can ever make it. we'll definitely be happy to have oh, you oh well we'll maybe we can figure that out i also mm-hmm. i have to say i really really love indian music yeah and uh, i listen to it frequently of course i and, i first discovered it from the beatles right you know mm-hmm. but no, um, i i uh, professor kosisto I, i i've been looking forward to this talk and i want to thank uh, somesh also for having you over i just want to ask you before i uh, you know unmute again i'm uh, sorry mute again mute again uh, yeah mute again sorry professor prasad uh, i just wanted to ask you that how much of your poetry emanates from the places you've been or the places you wish to be or are they all from your experiences of having been there just wanted to know that professor oh, thank you oh that's a great that's a great question uh no one has ever asked me that question before that's that's wonderful so obviously you know writing about places we have been is a common enough practice right because we have memories and sometimes we remember something uh mm-hmm. a bird a bird on a on a on a tree uh, outside a window in uh i don't know some some strange city uh that woke you up one morning and you forgot about mm. it but now you remember it and mm. this throws you back into all the memories and that that's the most common way i think to write but sometimes mm. i think about places i've never been and um mm. uh or or historical moments that i've never seen and uh and i become interested in trying to uh write about what that might be like or mm-hmm. you know what what it could be like to be there so i guess the answer is you can do both uh <laughs> you'll laugh at this uh i recently wrote a little uh bit of prose about uh the great italian opera singer enrico caruso who mm-hmm. in, in this little piece that i wrote is uh he's he's singing in st petersburg russia mm-hmm. with the great with the great russian uh, opera singer uh, fyodor chaliapin yeah. and the two and the two of them are singing for the tsar of russia uh <laughs> and The Tsar of Russia is listening to the two greatest opera singers of all time but what he's thinking about is how uncomfortable his underwear is. <laughs> okay. There are two hands. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you thank professor. You. And thank you Sandeep. Uh, thank Zarana. you sir. Zarana Sanders has been up for a while. Oh, I you know, I was just trying to write something strange and funny and I thought If you were the Tsar of Russia, uh you know, not only would you be an exquisitely stupid man, but you would probably have terrible underpants. Oh yes, of course. Yeah. You know. <laughs> uh is Zarana not online? I can see her hand up. Otherwise Nenu? Dr. Nenu Kumar? 
yeah uh thank you djv thank you so much and a wonderful wonderful uh, session uh, i mean i am particularly particularly taken in by this uh, phrase that has uh, been used by the esteemed guest uh, stephen inspirational pornography i have not come across this uh, phrase ever and i did not know about it and thank you for you know increasing my knowledge so what you know i mean a lot of us here i know this language uh, we use this one word for the uh, disabled and we call them you know people uh, divyang and and divya in itself as uh, or, uh, many of us would understand divya means extraordinary godly uh, out of this world something that you have not come across however a disability how does one say that a disability come godly or extraordinary or divya as as we call the divyang uh, i would like to know that as also the fact uh, could you please shed more light on inspirational pornography that you have used thank you great well i think the issue of language is very very important right how we talk about the disabled really matters and this is true across all inclusion uh paradigms right it's true across all neighborhoods uh we are symbol making animals human beings and we have a capacity to create metaphors about others that are demeaning and delimiting and the challenge is to take those apart and so how we talk about the disabled really matters you know in 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 uh in uh, uzbekistan i was astonished to discover that people who train to work with the disabled social workers who train to work with the disabled they call themselves are you ready for this they call themselves defectologists uh and you know so i was lecturing to those people saying well why would disability be defective what is the social construction of normalcy where does normalcy come from why is normalcy so prized when in fact no one can live up to it right uh so let's take that idea apart so the disabled are increasingly around the world demanding not only their place at the table uh but they're also uh trying to flip the story right we're not defective uh you know we're not limited we are just uh alternative human bodies and part of the whole picture of humanity right and so that's part of the process not only of being a disabled scholar or a scholar who uh favors and is interested in the rights of disabled people but it's also about being an artist with a disability and really trying to show not only is disability equal to everything else but it's interesting it's interesting right and you know i don't know if you have this expression in india but it's used all the time in the united states it drives me crazy you know uh it's thinking outside the box right and you know you'll hear this all the time you know uh in in some job interview you know uh that they'll say so can you give us an example of how you think outside the box disabled people think outside the box all the time right uh so we're problem solvers the disabled we are we are rich and imaginative and flexible and as i said lyrical and we're we're really interesting and that's part of the whole cultural diplomacy movement bringing disabled people together and traveling around the world interacting with other disabled people 
I think this movement is still very young. It's still in its, in its early days, but I hope that we see more and more of it uh, in the coming years. And especially now that we can do this, right? We can even zoom, right. uh, you know, that's exciting. Zarana, can you please unmute yourself? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, Professor, for us. absolutely fascinating talk. And I'm also a person with vision impairment. And uh, I would like to share a, um, a small anecdote. Uh, I went on a tour and uh, I thought of going for zip lining. And once I was done with, uh, with that yes. adventure, and I, I was asked by the guard who was standing there, he asked me, so how was your experience? I, I said, uh, it was good. Then he said, you know, you have an advantage because you can't see, you, you don't really get scared. And I only know how much scared I was before embarking on, 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 on this adventure. That's so interesting, isn't it? Because in a way, what that story tells us is that the guard, who is a perfectly good person, it shows us that he's limited in his thinking about blindness because of his sight, right? In other words, he thinks that if you can see what's coming ahead uh, and, you know, therefore you're going to be scared by zip lining, whereas if you can't see it, you won't have that experience. But he doesn't understand that the body is far more complicated. And it, you know, it, the body, when you're flying through space, uh, what's the word? Gyroscope, right? We have balance systems in our uh, inner ears and in various parts of the brain. Uh, you know, if we're flipped upside down or we're falling, we're going to be scared. And so whatever, you know, thrill there is in going fast through space, high in the air, the blind are going to experience that just as the sighted do. But he can't so, imagine that. He can't imagine that. Before we yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, thanks for the question, Zarana. There was, uh, uh, there's another raised hand, but there was a question in the box uh, where someone, I think Islam was asking whether there's any travel writing on blindness. Uh, well, um, that's an interesting question. You know, I, I wrote my little book, Eavesdropping, about traveling around and listening to landscapes because I couldn't find a book uh, on that subject. And so I thought, well, if I can't find that book, I might as well try to write one. Um, but I don't know of others at the present moment. And so that's interesting because it would make a great book, wouldn't it? We, if we got people from all over the world to write blind travel stories, that would be really cool. Professor, one more book of yours, Have Dog Will Travel. That's also something of that people Islam can read. <laughs> right. Of course. His books. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You know, and there was, uh, uh, there was another question there, but I could come back to it because Samir has had, had his hand up for a while. So, Samir? Yes. Uh, hi, Professor. Hello, uh, Samir. Sorry, I missed your call. I had the days like this and uh, like my internet connection is also a bit poor. But uh, picking up from your earlier discussion, I'm intrigued to ask you something and uh, I want all of us to think about it. I am not posing a question, but we can think about it. Like A, when us disables, like I'm a person with cerebral palsy. Uh-huh, okay. okay. Huh. Uh, so in our everyday interaction in college, uh, or in a, uh, like mostly in college because uh, or even at our place like home like either we are normalized either we are normalized or stigmatized okay 
so is there any good normality and bad normality <laughs> like we That's often <laughs> we often ask our friends or stranger please be normal with me don't behave like a stranger with me i have to say that's one of the best questions i've ever heard no one has also ever asked me that question before is there good normality versus uh, you know not so good normality and uh, one more thing, uh, one more oh, question oh sure sure more, like uh, today itself i was talking to a friend and she was telling me that samir in india you know in hindu philosophy we do not privilege body but we we privilege soul so yes, i yes correct ha huh. so i asked her if we privilege soul why disabled are discriminated <laughs> on so much levels so she could yeah. not answer me in a straight manner oh that is fantastic yeah um well first of all uh good normality versus bad normality right um let's say that good normality has something of utopia about it right uh in other words that good normality is imagination in the service of a better future for everybody so uh good normality is um it's about design justice uh there's a new movement emerging uh called design justice and it argues that when we build buildings or make new technologies those actions should be driven by the community's needs and not by people up top who are separated from human need so uh i don't know uh again in india but you know in the US uh we're having a problem now with uh with what you know AI artificial intelligence um if you go to the airport and you want to go through the security machine and they scan you in this big bubble machine right the uh algorithms that run the artificial intelligence that does the scanning are designed by uh a narrow group of human beings somewhere out in silicon valley and so if you're a person of color uh the ai algorithms will trigger an alarm if you're a person uh with uh maybe maybe uh you've had gender reassignment surgery uh whatever it is uh if your body isn't quite like the very narrow type of body the machine likes then you cause an alarm to go off Crazy, right? right and so this is a problem design justice says let's design the machine so that it's good for everybody and not just for this little narrow so good normality would be to create a normal world which is diverse and inclusive and is understanding of the wonderful strange beautiful variability of human beings right. bad normality is anything that tries to shrink this that you know and that often uses metaphor uh destructively to uh, turn other people who are not like us into problems or people who should be feared or you know should be dismissed uh, i will get political here i really really dislike donald trump and i dislike and i dislike uh all national leaders who engage in uh symbolizing others as uh problems in order to uh create more political power for themselves you know that goes against all the gods and it goes against everything uh that i think uh we're talking about today in terms of welcoming more people into the you know the vil- into the village right so uh the good normality would be design justice which is universal human rights now the other question uh about the soul and the body 
And you know, why are this, why is the disabled body such a problem if we really believe in the superiority of the soul? Um, I really think that it's hard for human beings to imagine that the gods or their god, you can look across religions, um, create the disabled body as part of their larger vision. It's hard for people because they think of, uh, of the divine as perfection. And they don't understand that um, the tree with tangled branches is also a beautiful thing to the gods. And so they have a hard time with that. And, um, you know, I think it's one of the reasons why cultural diplomacy with disability is so wonderful because my God, you know, I mean, the disabled make great music, man. No, no, that, was, no, no, that was a long answer, I'm sorry. But brilliant, I mean, I like the normality and, and, and design justice, a brilliant answer to that. Uh, before I go to Gunjan Kumari, whose hand has been up, there was a question in the box, it's been there for a while, uh, where somebody's asking you uh, whether you'd like to comment on John Milton as a blind poet. Sure. Uh, so John Milton was many people, right? That's what's interesting about him. I mean, he was, he, was, uh, he was opposed to the British monarchy and he was a revolutionary opposed to the king. Uh, you know, he sided, uh, you know, with uh, the overthrow of, uh, of the king. He was also uh, a very fundamentalist religious thinker, uh, what you know, became called a Puritan. Uh, he was also an extraordinary scholar, uh, you know, who uh, was really interested in um, saving religious traditions uh, and popularizing them in his poetry uh, for his country, which he felt was, you know, uh, becoming uh, less devout. And so writing Paradise Lost, uh, he was trying to reanimate, uh, you know, Judeo-Christian storytelling uh, for his country, which he thought was in decline. These are all very complicated things. Right. On the but other hand, on the other hand, he really was blind. And because of that, he was very introspective. And so, you know, one of the things we say about people who are blind is that they have inner sight. And while that may be a cliche, right, that that it's just a little bit too, too, too much. Um, he really did spend time often alone, often in solitude, uh, thinking deeply about the circumstances of his culture. And so his blindness allowed him to become creatively introspective in ways that had he been a sighted person, he might not have been, you know. Uh, so, um, you know, I think his blindness, you know, he writes that famous uh, sonnet, uh, when, when I think, uh, you know, how my light is spent, uh, you know, he's thinking about what advantage blindness brought to him. And he basically says, it slowed me down so that I could hear the wisdom of God. And so I think that was part of uh, his intelligence, his blindness. Um, we also know he wasn't a very friendly man. Uh, <laughs> so we can't say, you know, he was a, a really sweet and generous guy. We can't say that, but. Uh, As usual, complex. Right, uh, right. Gunjan, uh, I, I wanted to ask for a while. 
a question. Yes. Uh, hi, Professor Kusisto. This is Gunjit. Hello. 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 Uh, and uh, hi, Prasad sir and everyone else. Just so nice to hear you, Professor Kusisto. It was a, it's like dream coming true. I've read oh. a couple of your books like Eavesdropping and Planet of the Blind. And the way you use art for transforming, uh, transforming and informing, informing at once, the conflation of so many ideas, you know, renders the beauty which is unique. So the question which I have for you is, you know, in your Planet of the Blind, you write that there's no category called disability, right? In the United States, you write. And at the same time, we are seeking inclusion. So, you know, we want a category and identity as well as inclusion. So uh, it's a kind of, uh, I mean, it's a beautiful uh, conflation of the two ideas again, but how would you comment? We want a I category know. as well as in inclusion. So I know, okay. I know that's, that's the really hard part of this is that we can say it. We can say the disabled really are in the community. We belong in the community and the community can learn some things from us but the obstacles are still tremendous. They're tremendous and they're huge, right? I, I think somewhere in the talk I just gave, I, I mentioned how in the United States, there are still colleges and universities that make it hard for the disabled to go to school. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the websites and the software are not accessible that, you know, the isn't there some special place for you people? You know, I mean, there's still this, this quality. And uh, so we have to really spend our time all the time pushing this idea that we are here, we belong, we are people you can learn from, uh, we matter, uh, and there's no rest. If you believe this, then there's no rest because the world is unjust and uh, the people are sad all over the planet. And they're sad in developed nations and they're sad in the undeveloped nations. And this is why this whole notion of public education, uh, disability as diplomacy, of activism, it's why these things matter. Uh, I have to tell you that there are very few blind professors in the United States. I'm one of only a very small number. And every day I wake up and I feel strongly that an enormous number of disabled people remain unemployed. And this bothers me. I think about it all the time. I write about it all the time. I'm trying to push my university, Syracuse, to develop a program for disabled students in entrepreneurship. Yes, you've uh, written extensively about it. Really yeah. Extensively. It, yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, so there's no rest, right? Um, I think that's the thing, that the, the answer to your question is there's no rest. And, uh, and it's hard because it's easy to get depressed. I don't know about you, but, you know, some days I wake up and I go, oh, the mountain is so steep. And the path is so hard. Right. You know. Uh, so and then we I live it every day. Like we live this every day. And uh, I agree with you that, you know, though we, you know, pine for normalcy, this normalcy in itself has its own cost. There's so many, uh, you know, yeah. So many layered right. implications of uh, this talk in itself and your books as well. So there are times when I also don't know how to find the way out. Like we want our identity at the same time and we also want to be included and the way you have captured it, you know, I really want to hear uh, your experience in future as well, Professor. It was really great. You know, one, you. Thing that, one thing that I think really does have to happen in India, in New York, in Helsinki, uh, you know, in, in Tokyo, right? We need more disabled on the television, uh, you know, uh, in the movies. Uh, we need more depictions of disability as part of mainstream culture. 
and uh, but uh, unfortunately even the characters which are i mean disabled characters oh, are played by the non disabled ones so i know i know i know you i i hear you i mean uh you know look at look at all the james bond movies uh, where the disabled evil villain right you know uh there's a new james bond movie coming out soon and apparently the villains are all disfigured right they're all they've all got facial disfigurement well you know that i hate to say this in polite company but that pisses me off you know um it's the same old same old right i want a disabled james bond oh you yes know? that's what i want uh, <laughs> that's very true thank you so much thank you so much Yeah, there's Aparna who's hands been up for a while. So Aparna, next. Hi, Professor Cool Sister. I'm another blind person. Hello, um, Aparna. Hi. Hi. So I, you, you've been talking about how, you know, disabled people are different and you know produce arts that that's equally rich or richer. I've been wondering what is it uh, that you think that makes. someone part of disability culture i mean the bodily physical reality of disability is one thing but i'm also asking in terms of i'm someone who's been inclusive schooled all my life haven't really spent much time around disabled people before college i did i mean in undergrad and postgrad that's one thing but um, there's times when i feel conflicted when people talk about disabled communities like you know, one thinks in terms of am i a part of this am i not a part of this how much right, of this do right. i really get and um, i'm sorry I, uh, it's there's a little more uh, georgina creech has a has a book called more than meets the eye what blindness brings to art uh, there's someone she quotes in the book i don't recall the name at the moment who says uh, she's talking about tactile aesthetics and she says um, but touching isn't uh, you know automatic it's something it's something that's to be taught to you you learn to touch you don't just you know it's not instinctive and i was wondering how much of disability culture do you acquire and how well it's that's it also this these are the best questions anyone has asked me in a long time these are great questions uh so first of all no two people who have a particular disability experience that disability the same way so it, you yeah. know it's interesting when we talk about the blind or the deaf right um no two people who are blind or deaf experience that in the same way so disability is enormously impractical when we talk about human experience and it's important to recognize that right that's actually a, a kind of liberating thought when you realize i'm an individual and my needs and the way that i think and navigate are mine um that's important because it's part of disability culture right in the sense that uh let's say well let me give you an example from my daily life so um I can see a tiny bit with this eye if I hold something up very close. Mm -hmm. But I can't do it for very long. So you could hand me a piece of large print uh and I could read it for a little bit. But then what happens? I get tired. Uh right. I can e I even get headaches. So if somebody told me, some normal normative person told me I know all about blindness. You need large print. Mhm. Mm uh I would say well maybe for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> But the rest of the time the rest of the time I need braille or a you know talking uh Same you know uh -huh. computer or iPad or whatever. And um disability culture is knowing what your experience of your disability is right and it's knowing how to advocate for you right not letting somebody who doesn't know about disability but maybe has a degree hanging on the wall you know <laughs> tell you 
how it should be for you, right? So right. the first part of disability culture is being a smart self advocate who can say, no, this is what I need and you can't tell me, right? That's freedom. Right. But then the, the larger question, of course, is the, is the deeper question, which is what is disability culture, right? Um, yeah. And then that becomes, you know, well, what is culture itself? And I like this definition of culture. Let's see what you think. Um, um, culture is craft. It's culture. Culture is, is the making of things. And so disability culture is about making a better future and a better present for those of us with disabilities. And therefore disability culture says the past and all the stories that have been told about us in the past are no longer uh, applicable and they're no longer relevant. Uh, the world has changed, right? right? Mm -hmm. And so once you arrive at that place, then disability culture is basically a way of saying uh, normal people who imagine they're normal uh, no longer <laughs> get no longer get to define me. I am I am unique and remarkable in my own terms, and you don't get that power anymore. I think that's the core of disability culture, um, and you know. But how you enact that is important in your own terms um, because there's freedom there to take that and use it in your own way. Right. Does that make, does that make sense? I don't know. It does. And the definition appeals to me quite a bit. Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's an opportunity to make new ways of thinking, you know. So who taught us how to touch, Right. Well, nobody. One was actively discouraged, actually. <laughs> ex exactly. So we. So here's the thing: we take touch, and we use it in new and more powerful ways. Right. Um, right. I think. I think that's what that's about. You know. Right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Hey. I this, think. That, oh, sorry. Sorry, Aparna. Can we move to Shampa now? No, sir, I was cross questioning, so I don't know if it was if it was correct. So I I just I'm good. Gunjan, not a partner. I, I I was just asking, sir, if it is uh, okay. I mean, even those people who disapprove of this culture, because there are people in deaf culture, we, we have two sections, if you I mean, of course, all of us know that there are people who accept this culture, uh, who accepts who write deaf with D, capital D, and there are people who don't want to be a part of, who don't want to accept the language as sign language. So this uh, whole discussion gives uh, legitimacy, I mean, to both the sections, right? So nobody can define uh, culture or identity for anyone. Just wanted to add. So it's really interesting, you know, people generally uh, feel um, they, they feel that they don't have power and they don't have power over their own lives. They don't have power over their own circumstances. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of disabled people, but it could be, it could be anyone who hails from a historically, you know, marginalized position. And so, uh, you know, you can have culture wars, right? Um, and, in the deaf community here in the United States and in around the world, there's an argument between big D deaf culture, uh, which understands uh, sign language as a primary um, core value for cultural autonomy and power versus uh, deaf people or hearing impaired people who, who don't look at it that way. And the interesting thing is, if you take what I said just a few minutes ago, uh, that no two disabled people are alike and that their days are complicated, uh, then you know the, the larger 
question is, uh, how do we assure maximum freedom uh, for, uh, for everyone? I know, I know blind people in the United States who um, travel with uh, the white pain who have absolute contempt for the blind people who travel with guide dogs. And these two groups fight. They fight. They're, they're you know, and, um, and, you know, I keep thinking, wow, that's a waste of time. Um, I don't know how many of you have ever read this, you know, the famous uh, British, well, he's actually Irish writer, Jonathan Swift, uh, wrote that famous book, Gulliver's Travels. Yes, all of us have. Right. right. And, and there's a funny section in the book where he travels to a country where the people have had a civil war for a hundred years and they are fighting over which end of the boiled egg do you crack open, the small end or the big end? And that has always seemed to me to be a perfect comic description of how human beings often behave with each other, right? And we see this in every historically marginalized community. You know, I have a friend who's a, a, a scholar of African-American studies, and he talks about how in the black community in the U.S., there are arguments over, are you, you know, what, what, how black are you, right, in terms of your skin pigmentation? And that there's this ranking that goes on within, you know, black uh, culture. And it's very pain, terribly painful. Uh, and so this gets me back to what I was saying before, that we want to free people from having to adopt a narrow position or one that's defined by other people. Um, and to give people the power to determine for themselves what's best for them in their lives without harming other people, right? I mean, that, that's a very core principle that I want what's best for you, but I also don't want you harming other people, right? right. I mean. Professor Kusisto, your talk and your answers and your discussion is, has, you know, is so interesting that more and more people want to join the discussion. But we are running out of time. So very quickly, Shampa. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you, sir, uh, for not only for your talk, but for being with us here today from bottom of my heart. Thank you so much. Uh, sir, I just uh, want to um, uh, share one of my observation and then uh, ask a little question after that. Uh, what uh, Sandeep sir has said before, before this, uh, that when we read your book, we really uh, can connect. Uh, I mean, I personally feel, uh, oh, it's really about me. I feel like this. I mean, I experience the same thing. So uh, uh, thank you for, for uh, uh, doing that great job and for, for uh, 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 feeling uh, like this, uh, connecting uh, people like us. And uh, my about my observations, uh, uh, when we, uh, we have talked about the blind travel uh, writing, Yes. If we if we turn uh, now to uh, fiction, basically, what we see, uh, I mean, I have never found myself in any uh, fiction uh, so far. Uh, uh, by the way, I am um, legally blind and I'm rapidly uh, going blind. So uh, mm -hmm. I have never found myself. And uh, what we have seen, first, it was uh, the negative stereotype. And then what we have uh, said that the inspirational uh, pornographic things. Yes. And nowadays, what is coming out is basically informative. What uh, we do, how we uh, use voiceover or JAWS, how we uh, use our phone, et cetera, et cetera. So, but our psychological journey, I haven't found in any fiction our psychological journey uh, in, in detail, so to speak. Uh, so, sir, my uh, little question is that, uh, does it lie only us, the responsibility of uh, bringing ourselves in the picture? Or what can be the possible ways uh, to bring ourselves in the arena of literature? I mean, uh, not as a part, not as stereotype, but as a whole, an entity. Yeah, this is also a, a great and important question. 
Uh, you know, there's this term uh, in literary criticism. I think it was invented by two scholars, David and Sharon Mitchell, uh, called narrative prosthesis. <laughs> uh, basically, it means uh, that in general terms, non-disabled writers use disability uh, in order to move their stories. And this is never uh, about real disabled people at all. They use disabled people as symbols to advance their stories. So it's, it's a, you know, it's like, you, it's, a, it's a crutch in their stories, right? We suffer from that as, as the disabled, right? We do. And we see this all the time uh, in, in fiction and movies where people have used disability uh, in negative ways, pejorative ways, damaging ways. Uh, it happens all the time. You know, Jose Saramago, the you know, uh, Spanish writer, wrote this novel, Blindness, in which, uh, you know, everybody in the world catches a virus and goes blind. And, you know, the book is terrible. Uh, and all it does is reinforce for sighted people the fear of blindness. And, you know, the blind people become kind of zombies. And, you know, it's, it's an awful book. Uh, but that's an example of it, right? That it's narrative prosthesis and it's, it's, uh, it's a crappy book. We need as disabled people to be writing our stories now. And we need to write the disabled novels. And we need to write the, you know, the the novel by the legally blind person who is telling their story in their way. We need that. I'm trying very hard to create opportunities for that to happen here in the US. And I would like to make it global, creative writing online globally for disabled writers. So we need you know, that. You, you need to write your story. You know, uh, there was a comment the question in the chat box that you're uh, probably you're talking about an alternative aesthetics, your alternative, you know. So it's a it's a wonderful thing to do. And Somishwa has been online. He's been, you know, one the time is running out. I was going to take a few more questions, but we don't have the time now. Uh, I know this is a discussion. Can take carry. Some questions if you want. Uh, it's seven thirty. Is it all right? Uh, sir, uh, Professor Puchesto, would you like to take another couple of questions? If it's Absolutely. Right? Okay, sure. then. Arvind Bhatt's hands been up. Yes. Yes. yes sir. Uh, uh, so, Professor Kuesisto and Professor Prasad, uh, this has been a wonderful talk. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yes, I can yes. hear you. Yeah. So, just a small anecdote and then uh, 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 I don't know, probably a question or a, a comment which you might like to respond to. Uh, so uh, some years ago, I was sitting with a, a friend uh, in a restaurant and uh, uh, we were just waiting for our uh, food to, uh, you know, to be cooked and served. A very small eatery and... Uh, I was just listening to uh, the, the, the cook uh, preparing uh, something uh, in a frying pan and he was beating out a tattoo uh, on the pan uh, with uh -huh, his uh -huh. skillet, right? And right. Uh, I remarked to my friend, uh, my uh, you know, companion, uh, you know, do you hear that? It's, it's so musical, isn't it? So rhythmic. And she comes back with this uh, very strange question. She, say, she says, uh, what are you referring to? What are you talking about? What rhythm? And I was flabbergasted because, you know, the sound was so loud. And it got me thinking. And I thought, well, I mean, she, she was sighted. I thought, uh, you know, what is visible must be taking up so much of her uh, consciousness and attention that she cannot even hear, uh, you know, a, a, a loud musical rhythmic sound. So... Uh, my question is simply this, and I have wondered about this for a long time, uh, also taking off from uh, the Indian-American writer, Ved Mehta. Yes, um, wonderful yeah. writer. Yes, indeed. Uh, now, uh, my question is this. Uh, uh, both she, my friend, and I, uh, 
uh, although I cannot see, I'm also visually impaired, blind, uh, and she was sighted. But both of us can hear. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we could appreciate music if we did want to. Uh, but, right. you know, she, she failed to hear that uh, very rhythmic uh, tattoo on the frying pan. So my question is this. Um, do you think that uh, people uh, are so taken up with one sense that they cannot develop other sensory uh, ways of uh, knowing the world, being in the world. Uh, does this, uh, um, or, or you know, do blind people also have the risk of falling in this into this trap? Uh, what do you think? So that's a really great question. Uh, there's uh, a neurologist named Norman. Doidge, D-O-I-D-G-E, Norman Doidge, who wrote a book on what he calls neuroplasticity. And he argues that uh, we, we used to think that the human brain uh, did not have the capacity to repair itself, repair itself if it had an injury and we used to believe that the brain was sort of pre-constructed uh, and sort of frozen and that it, it couldn't change during a person's lifetime. But what they have discovered in neurology is that uh, different parts of the brain can in fact, uh, to use an electrical metaphor, rewire themselves. That uh, parts of the brain can take over for other parts of the brain that have perhaps been injured. So with the blind, for instance, um, we use a lot of the brain that was reserved for seeing actually to improve our hearing. Right. And so we have, we have much more advanced hearing, you know, this was always a debate in the past. Did the blind really hear better? Well, maybe they do. Maybe it's just that some blind people listen better. Who knows? Well, now we know that, the, that, that this is really true, that our brains have rewired themselves to use more power for hearing. Therefore, the answer to your question is your friend who is sighted doesn't hear what's going on. She's not using parts of her brain. Not much. Yeah. So that the that's actually a neurological story, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. But what about the blind falling into a similar trap of being of you know just uh, being taken up with just one sense, say hearing or touch? You know, uh, is there such a trap, or do you think we are more? Uh, no, I think I think anything that limits the way human beings imagine their lives, anything that limits your imagination is a trap, right? Um, you know, we, we see this in blind history. They used to say of blind people, well, you can be a piano tuner. That was, that was always, you know, the, the big job for the blind, uh, you know, uh, learn to be a piano tuner. Well, you know, I mean, why not become a scientist? Uh, you know, why not be a mathematician? Uh, why not be a rocket scientist? I mean, these are all things blind people can do, right? Uh, so you're right. We don't want to get trapped into a very narrow picture of what we can do and who we can be. Mm, indeed, indeed. Thank you, you know? so much. Yes. Yeah. Since uh, Somish hasn't exercised the guillotine, I take one more question right now. Sayuja Santosh. Hi, sir. Hello. Hi. I, I too am a blind person from Kerala. Uh, it was wonderful to listen to you. And uh, I want to address something. Uh, I, I used to write, uh, not so frequently. And uh, in last poem uh, in which I wrote, I wrote that I uh, at my heart I have uh, colors that the world uh, have not seen. Such, such things. So... Uh, after writing that, I got confused that whether people will question me that uh, I am like romanticizing blindness. Mm, so, mm -hmm. would, but it, it was my genuine feeling, but I, 
I go, I then there after I got such a confusion after I so could you please yeah I it, that's a really interesting thing too all these questions are so good I I was once criticized when my first memoir Planet of the Blind appeared uh, a writer in London accused me she was blind herself accused me of making blindness beautiful when in fact it isn't beautiful at all. She accused me of this. And <clears throat> I thought that was really interesting uh, because first of all, I believe in beauty. And, you know, I don't think beauty is limited to just the sighted. I think the blind have access to beauty I think beauty is political. I think people try to steal beauty from you. Well, I get to have beauty and so do you. Right. We all get to have beauty, right? So uh, think about Beethoven who went you know, completely deaf and he could still hear all that beauty in his head and he could write it down and we still get to hear it. That's fantastic. You yes, know, I, I have one more question. And sure. I happened to read uh, an essay uh, in which the use of uh, differently able was defended. Uh, in that essay, it was written, blind people can uh, read and write using Braille or uh, screen readers. Uh, even now, even we have softwares uh, which describe pictures and we can sure. navigate around using uh, white game. So uh, uh, in that essay, they suggested that the use of different, we are different and in different ways, we are able to do what the um, people with sight do. So uh, the, in that essay, it is said that the use of differently able for which, uh, visually challenged people is not uh, a term which is apolitical or uh, yeah, is rom romanticizing the uh, uh, our blindness. Yeah. So I too felt this uh, the same. But um, the disability right activists always used to say we are not differently able, we are disabled. So I used to get this confusion after reading this essay. Can you uh, clarify that too? So it you know it's really interesting. Uh, the word disability enters uh, you know culture in the very early 19th century. And the first person to use it was Karl Marx. And he used the term to designate people who had become injured and could no longer work in the factories. And in the early 19th century, factories, industrial manufacture had become the new primary engine of economic life in places like Britain, or France or, or, or the United States. And so from the very beginning, the word disability has a, a negative value. It means you no longer have uh, the power to earn money and be productive in the economy. The problem with differently abled, which is, you know, the idea behind that is disability is not such a good word. It convinces people that, that uh, you know, uh, people who are physically different have no value. That's a bad word. Let's find something new. So they say differently abled. Well, of course, everybody's differently abled, right? I mean, um, you know, I can play guitar, but I can't play piano, you know? I mean, so we're all differently abled, and it seems like the wrong word. Many people with disabilities are fighting to keep the word disability because they see it as a, you know, a proud identity. And so, you know, again, you have to decide what's good for you. Uh, not, you know, letting other people make determinations. Uh, I happen to believe <laughs> that in the next 25 years, uh, many things that we take for granted now are going to vanish because of technological uh, innovations. So for instance, let me give you an example. If you follow the news, you have seen that the country of Australia has angered the nation of France because they decided not to buy submarines from France 
and instead are going to buy submarines from the United States. Here's what I think. I think in, in about 15 years, submarines will no longer be useful because we will be able to see from space into the very bottoms of the ocean, <laughs> right? And in, and in fact, that could happen next year, right? Uh, you're a high tech country. I mean, it could happen right now. So, um, you know, it's also true if we stay on a naval theme that the United States Navy has now figured out how to run their ships, how to power their ships using seawater. Well, you know, technology is changing very, very quickly. And I believe that the disabled are going to have easy access to technology that is going to put us into the mainstream in ways that we can't conceive of right now. And, you know, we talk in theoretical terms about, about um, you know, the post-human, that technology and the post-human will be the new age. I don't know if that's true, but I can tell you this. I just walked around the city of Boston uh, using only my talking Apple watch to give me directions to places I needed to go. And it was perfect. And so, wow, right? I mean, that was very cool. Uh, that didn't exist two years ago, right? So, uh, you know, times are changing and I think disability will change with it. Professor Prasad. Yes. With your permission, last question, 45 yes. seconds only. Can I, can, I, can I quickly, quickly ask Somesh what? Uh, uh, I think we'll let us bring uh, this to an end. It's already so. Somesh, so just last, time. last question, uh, Sandeep. If somebody yeah. comes after you, Sandeep. Okay, fine, fine. <laughs> no, because he's he's a person with blindness. I writes prolifically, so I only wanted to ask on behalf of all of us in India that uh, what methodology or what uh, technique does he use to? Uh, I mean, does Professor Kosisto use to write? Because all of us have a story, but many of us don't have altogether a right. very great skill of uh, typing or anything. So if there's anything uh, particular that uh, Professor Kosisto uses to write uh, his books or his poems or his stories uh, uh, and the method, if you could just talk about. And how, okay. how can we hear him more often? That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Well, the last part of that question, I don't know the answer to. I, I think I need a, I, I think I need a, a podcast, don't I? Um, <laughs> yes. But, um, so I'll work on that. Um, so uh, basically, I just use um, uh, Apple products with the voiceover screen reading software. Uh, I used to use all of the, uh, you know, what do they call it? IBM PC. Uh, technology, but I switched to Apple about 10 years ago when they made a deep commitment to making all their products blind friendly. And so I just write on a regular Mac uh, laptop. Uh, I also have an iPad that I carry with me. I read books that way, uh, you know, uh, EPUB books uh, yeah. with the voiceover uh, application. Uh, I have found the Apple products to be very user friendly. Uh, and uh, so, yeah, it's, you know, it's no big secret. I type. Uh, that's mm. kind of how I, how I do it. You, the dictation is good, but uh, I like typing. So I do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank Sorry, you. Professor Prasad and Somesh. Right. No, that was a good last question to end with. I'm sorry I'm not taking other questions now because we're way, way past time. And uh, before I hand it go back to Somesh to thank everyone, my own thanks to Professor Kusisto. It was a wonderful, wonderful session. Thank you, sir. Well, let's do it again. Oh, uh, yes. there's, there's, no, there's no limitation on this. I, this. I have enjoyed this immensely. So thank you. Uh, so thank you, Professor Prasad, for moderating the session. And a big thank you to Professor Kuchisto for presenting what I would call a many layered, evocative, thought provoking uh, talk. And uh, he ended the one of his questions, the questions by referring to the Apple Watch and saying, 
Wow, so cool. I think I could say the same about his talk today. <laughs> it was oh. absolutely wonderful and breathtaking. And I don't know, should I say awe-inspiring? Or would you oh. like to use me of uh, inspirational pornography? <laughs> <laughs> that's, well, look, that's yeah. Uh, but this is the thing. This is cultural diplomacy right here. We're we're having a you know we're having a real meeting of the minds, and and this is wonderful. But what uh, really perplexed me, uh, Professor Kuchestu, is the desire to see a James Bond who is disabled. Oh. And still being perplexed by inspiration, inspiring <laughs> pornography. I know that things are complex and we need to try to work things away. There is no black and white answers to things. Everything is in a right. state of gray. But there is a final request that I would like to make in front of everybody on behalf of the center and on the behalf of the all the participants here, let us be a part of the cultural diplomacy that you have outlined. Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Professor. Yes. And it would be a great pleasure to have you again. And uh, what should I say? You have left me dumbfounded in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's agree to do it again. It's very simple. Absolutely. I like this idea. Yeah, great. So that All is right. cultural diplomacy at work. All at right, its man. best, well, it, I guess. As, uh, as Ringo Starr would say, peace and love to all of you. Uh, Amen. Thank you so much. Thank mm -hmm. you, Mr. Prasad. Thank you. Professor Kuchesto, thank you, the participants, for being so involved and engaged in the session. And a big thank you for the sign interpreters, Gargi and Stuti. Yes. Wonderful. Thank we you. Okay. Pr promise Bye. the participants that we are meeting tomorrow at 4 p.m. with another interesting session. Thank you so much. Thank you. Also, now I'm good. Alert, the name of the Lizlock was left the meeting.